<laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started today. We'll start by talking about some um, questions about the quiz. Uh, I promise we talked a little bit about nuclear reactions and what nuclear means and nuclear bombs, nuclear power plants, all that good stuff. So I'll answer a couple questions about these. Um, so just first off, a quick, what's going on at the nuclear level? What makes a nucleus a nucleus in the first place is kind of the, what the rest of these questions all come from. Because a nucleus shouldn't stick together, right? What's in the nucleus? Protons and neutrons. And the key with protons is the S at the end, right? Protons, plural. What should positive charges do to other positive charges? Reject each other, right? Repulse each other, push each other away. So that's actually the, the first two forces that you learn about just from everyday life. Um, the first one is gravity. The first thing you learn about as a kid, the first thing you develop an intuition for is the force of gravity, right? Because things fall. And when you're seven months old, that's really surprising. And you want to check and see if that happens every time, right? And so you start to develop an intuition with, if I push my food off the plate, it falls on the floor. And that's really funny to a seven month old. Um, the next force we start to have some sort of understanding of is electromagnetic force. So, you know, you play with magnets. Now, now we're usually talking about before you can really start to get the hang of what's going on with those. Um, you're like, four, five, six, when you get those magnetic building blocks and you can play around with making the poles opposite and having them push each other away. That's the second physical force. The third and fourth primary forces in physics are not something that you see in everyday life ever really. They're called the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force are basically the what cause a nucleus to stick together as a nucleus. Um, when your strong nuclear force is stronger than the weak nuclear force, it means there's more binding force, binding energy, than there is electromagnetic force pushing those um, protons away from each other. And so what happens when you break that apart is that 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 binding energy can get released. And that's what we think of as, as nuclear energy or splitting the atom is what happens when you take an, a nucleus and it physically breaks into pieces because all of that binding energy that was holding it together is now be, gonna be released as heat or light or both. So in terms of splitting an atom, splitting an atom is really something that happens on its own and same, this is going to answer both of those second two questions, um, second and third. Splitting atoms is, the, is naturally what occurs when something goes through a radioactive process. So any radioactive element or isotope is going to be constantly, a sample will constantly be going through radioactive decay. And basically what that means is there's a certain, for every given unit of time, let's call it a, for every minute, there's a certain probability that a nucleus will split up into separate pieces and that energy gets released in the form of, of light or heat. Um, and so the, the half-life of a material is related to what is what are the odds that that happens in any given minute. So if the odds are, like, if it's 99.9% .9 chance that a nucleus splits up into, into smaller pieces, that's going to have a really short half-life. In terms of something like uranium, if you have a sample of a single atom, there might be a one in a, in a billion chance that it splits up in any given minute. And so it's a little bit like a progressive slots or something at the casino, right? Where it doesn't hit, doesn't hit, doesn't hit, doesn't hit jackpot, right? The odds of getting that jackpot are like the odds of that nucleus splitting into pieces. We can tweak those odds though if we get to a certain amount, if we put it into certain conditions. So if you take a whole bunch of a nuclear material, you can get it to go through that process sooner than it normally would. You can change those odds because a lot of times, so the 
uranium, what we need, uranium 238, I think, is the one that's used in bombs. Uranium 238 um, can split up into making a basically a helium nucleus um, that has a plus two charge. It's helium missing its two electrons, and that's how we, got, we called it an alpha particle when we were talking about the atomic theory. And then it turns into the other, what's left of the uranium turns into thorium 234. Well, that's what happens naturally to uranium. But if you take uranium 238 and you hit it with a neutron, so it has a mass of one and zero for its atomic number, it doesn't just it splits this up into two smaller pieces. I don't remember exactly what they are off the top of my head, but you get two fragments, which is probably X and Y, and three more neutrons. And those neutrons just sort of fly out from the nucleus when it breaks apart. Well, a neutron is what started this process, right? So if you happen to have a big enough sample of uranium-238 that when it breaks apart and makes these neutrons, more of these neutrons get captured by the rest of the sample and continue this process, you get a chain reaction happening. Where every time one of these uraniums gets hit with a neutron, it splits into pieces and makes three more neutrons, which each hit another uranium and starts that process. You get exponential growth happening, right? Every time this happens, you get three more neutrons. The point where you have enough uranium where you actually wind up with that capture being more likely than not is called critical mass. That's actually where that phrase comes from. Uh -huh. If you have a big enough chunk of uranium, you'll wind up with a runaway reaction in which if it goes, if it's big enough and it goes fast enough is turns into a nuclear explosion. So the nuclear bombs work by basically taking a bunch of slugs of uranium-238 that are about a certain, uh, they're about half, I think the, they're half of the critical mass and you took eight of them. And you basically use dynamite to fire those things towards each other like bullets, but all of these bullets aiming towards each other and fusing into one big chunk of uranium when they hit each other. And now you've got something that's four times larger than the critical mass. And that process starts happening so quickly that you got wind up with the entire thing going off and you get a mushroom cloud. You release all of that nuclear binding energy more or less at once. And so that's the power required to split an atom. Well, the, the atom will split on its own. It's more about just tweaking the conditions so that it does it on its own and does it in a runaway chain reaction sort of way. A nuclear power plant uses this top process and the goal is to not let this happen. And so that's why you have these cooling rods and you have them submerged in water. Basically all a nuclear power plant does is it uses the fact that this releases heat to boil water. And then it uses that boiled water to spin a turbine, just like, just like a fossil fuel power plant. You burn it, make steam, steam spins a turbine that has a magnet attached to it and that makes current. So at its heart, nuclear power plants are basically just trying about allowing this to happen because it normally would be happening naturally anyway, just in the crust of the earth instead of in a power plant. You just have to concentrate what's already there and then preventing this from happening. And so that's that's why you know you we tend to remember the um, um, the exceptions to the rule, for the most part, nuclear power plants are really, really safe and are way less likely to cause radiation-based um, death than actually coal power plants. Coal power plants release enough radioactive material into the air that you actually, if you live within like 10 miles of a coal power plant, you have an increased chance of getting cancer as a result of the radiation from the coal being burned. And it's way higher than the, than the odds of getting cancer if you live next to a nuclear power plant, which seems counterintuitive, but we're pretty good at engineering for the most part. Um, the biggest ones that people think of like Chernobyl and Fukushima were both, Chernobyl was a failure of management and 
a power plant that was built to standards that never would have been approved in the US, even in the 50s. And it was operating in the 80s. So it was 30 years out of date, built to conditions that wouldn't have passed code in the US. And then management shut down all the safety protocols to try and see what would happen, basically. They, wanted, they ran a drill and the engineer said, don't shut that off for this drill. It won't come back on fast enough. And they shut it off anyway, um, because they decided they wanted to, to test everything. Yeah, they used it. So they, the way that these work is you basically have these, these graphite rods that they're called coolant rods to kind of alternate with the fuel rods. And when you want to generate more electricity, when you want the temperature of your water to go up more, you pull the, cool, the coolant rods out of the way and that exposes these toward to each other more. And so you get more of this second type of reaction happening. You get closer to having critical mass. And then when you want to slow it down, you put the cooler rod, rods back in and they just soak up all the extra radiation and they slow down that process. Um, so that one of the issues was that, that those coolant rods um, basically in the, in the, over the course of this drill that became a real emergency, they pulled the coolant rods out to simulate um, being, you know, needing to generate more electricity due to demand. And then they shut down the systems that were responsible for putting the coolant rods back in to try and see if they could go fast enough to reboot the systems to prevent a, a breakdown, which clearly didn't, I mean, kind of happened. It wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been, but um, it was really a failure at the management level, not at the engineering level or the science level. And that was a system, like I said, that was way out of date when it was built. And then it still worked perfectly for 30 years before Chernobyl happened. Can you go? Okay. Um, and so this, I wanted to talk about questions. I should have reordered these. The top question in this bottom, in this fourth question, um, relate to different isotopes. Um, and this is relevant because we're going to talk about isotopes more later. So I'm not just spending time talking about nuclear because I think it's cool, although I do. Um, every element has certain isotopes that are radioactive. And that happens when those two binding forces, the nu weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force, are out of sync with each other. You wind it with an unstable nucleus that has a potential for, for breaking down. And when you get elements that are really small, you get more stable by building them up into bigger nuclei. That's what's happening in, in a fusion reaction and what's happening in stars. If you get an element that's too big, the opposite happens where it breaks up into smaller pieces. And so small things tend to get bigger to become more stable. Large nuclei become smaller to become more stable. But there's a, a certain point where you get the most stable nucleus where you've got the maximum nuclear binding energy. Um, and that happens to be iron, an iron nucleus of certain isotope. And I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head, maybe 56. Um, iron 56 or whatever that isotope is, is the most stable nucleus you can have. And so that's, so that top question is, is a bit of a probably misheard or misspoke in the first place. Um, all stars die, though, when they get to the point where there's more iron in them than anything else, or a little bit before that, because basically once you get react or nuclei fused to the point where most of them are iron, you can't go through any more fusion reactions. I mean, you can, but you don't get more energy out of it. So basically what happens is the fusion reaction that powers the sun will eventually stop when you get to too much iron in the core of the sun. Um, and depending on the size of the sun, either then it winds up expanding and becoming a, a red dwarf or sorry, a red giant, um, or it can go through a supernova. You can have a variety of different things happen that are all based on what, how big the star was to begin with. Um, but it, they all, what they all share in common is the fact that iron is that end point. When a star gets to that point where you've got that much iron in it, it slows everything down. 
So a single frying pan being thrown into a star is unlikely to change anything. Um, but that's probably where that came from, was that idea that everything eventually will become iron. When the, at the very end of the universe, when all react, chemical reactions cease, everything will be an iron atom because that's gonna be the most stable state. You don't have anything else that could turn into iron if everything's already iron. So it's kind of an interesting thing. If you, if you want to learn about the end of the universe, look at the heat death of the universe. There's some interesting concepts in there. Um, but like I said, every element has at least one isotope that's on. Actually, they have a lot more isotopes that are unstable than stable usually. And that's just when you have that mismatch between the number of neutrons and protons, because that's what really controls that weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force is the ratio of protons to neutrons. Um, and then last thing about this. If you were, if we're talking about something that's synthetic and has a really, really short half-life, how do you know that we actually made any of this stuff? Well, you can actually look at um, some of these particle accelerators. They actually provide all their data for every experiment is provided online. You just have to know what to do with it to actually interpret it. But it pretty much all gets, um, you can export it as, a, as an Excel file basically. And then you can make your own graphs and analyze the data that way. Um, but you can play around with, with some of these, and I don't even know what a lot of these mean other than two to 1.2 to 110, that's giga electron volts. Um, so that's gonna be the, the energy of a certain collection. And so this has to do with what angles they're, they're moving in. Uh, this is, that's an angle. This, this is the one I was gonna look at. Look at the phi angle of the first lepton direction is referring to the subatomic particles and what angle they hit they come off at when you when you hit these things together. If you know what angle they come off at, you know what size the object is that they hit, what the charge on it is. So you have to work at it from here to go to figure out what exactly is going on and what it what it all means. But at the same time, this is kind of what the raw data looks like. It looks like Excel charts that then you can take and process and try and interpret what does that actually mean. Um, and the earliest ones looked like, um, bubble tanks, is that what they call them? Basically you could look at bubble chambers, that's what they were called. Um, there were these, these things here, they basically just filled these tanks with water and then fired radioactive particles into it and watch what happened to the bubbles because you could track where the particles were going based on where bubbles formed um, due to um, it boiling. And you wind up with really weird looking data that looked, I'm not sure if you can see that one. So that's what the bubbles would actually look like and you can't see it too well. Um, Basically, if, if the particles are moving in the straight line, you can see when they run into something and you wind up with these weird little angles and curly cues happening. That was basically the way that they could work backwards and use really complicated trig to figure out what it ran into and what the charge had to be. Um, so this is the old school analog way of doing this is they would literally trace the directions and the shapes these bubbles made in these bubble tanks. Now we do it all um, digitally and we just export our data as, a, as an spreadsheet. Um, but it's the same basic principles that we're using. Um, somebody, somebody didn't think that any of our labs have been fun yet, I guess. Maybe I'm just being defensive. We don't get to do a lot of the really fun labs in this class, unfortunately, because you guys need a certain baseline level of competence. Um, and I'm not trying to be insulting, but you're not there yet. Um, when it comes to being in a lab, before we can do really fun stuff like build batteries out of copper plates and solutions and you can hook up wire and you can measure the voltage between these two things you can like basically replicate some of the earliest um batteries that were called galvanic cells or voltaic cells I think that's zinc, copper, and... the very first one was a zinc you zinc piece of zinc metal and piece of copper metal in a solution of zinc ions and copper ions and you hook a wire up between them and you can get the reaction to happen or basically move electrons from one side to the other. 
and generate current that way. So we actually get to do that lab in Gen Chem, do stuff like synthesize aspirin from, from willow bark extract. Um, so we can do some of those fun things once we get to a point where, um, where we have that baseline level of knowledge and competence in lab. Um, so hang in there. Um, I would actually say that the, the lab we did last week was probably the most fun lab um, because it's fun to play with colors and waves and stuff like that, even if it's kind of tricky to wrap your head around. Um, if you're having been having fun geeking out in Excel, we have some good Excel labs coming up um, where we're going to take some data for gases and plot pressure versus volume and stuff like that. And we can actually derive some fundamental qualities, which if you enjoy that, that'd probably be the most fun lab. But if you don't, um, it'll be a slog, but we'll get you through it and you'll feel more competent at the other end, at least. Uh, one more random question, then three that are relevant. Matte versus glossy paint. I thought this was a good question. Um, and it, it's easiest to answer this question when we have, when I have a whiteboard. So I thought this was good to, to do here. Um, when something has a, a glossy or a mirror finish on it, when you're talking about paints or cars or um, a guitar, a glossy finish basically means that your the surface is really, really flat. And so that when any waves, any light waves come in, they come, they bounce off at the same angle that you would normally expect, like you're throwing, like bouncing a pool ball off of the rail on a pool table. Right? So they come off at a very predictable angle. And if all of them are coming in at the same angle and bouncing off at the same angle, then you wind up with the same image basically being shown that bounced off in the first place, right? All of those waves still wind up being in the same general direction. So they appear as like a mirror. That's what a mirror actually does. If you take this surface and instead of making it smooth, if you make it really rough, now all of a sudden, this one that hits is going to bounce off more or less the same way, but this one, when it hits, is going to turn around and bounce off that way. And same here, right? So instead of having everything bounce off in the same direction and looking like a mirror finish, you wind up with it scattering and you get a, a matte finish that has more of an effect of like frosted glass because you can still see general light. It's not absorbing more light. It's absorbing just the same amount of light. It's just scattering it out in all directions. Right? Which is why a frosted glass on light bulbs makes them the whole light bulb, the whole area seem brighter as opposed to like an old school Edison bulb where you know, you've got one part of it that burns your retina when you look at it and the rest of it doesn't really reflect light very well, right? Uh, it's because it doesn't have that frosted glass, that matte finish. And it's way easier when I can draw a picture than when I have to type to try and explain what's happening. So I thought that was, that was just easier for everybody. All right, orbitals and electrons. Um, we're gonna skip free radicals for a second and talk about electron configurations. Do we have to follow an order first S, then P, then finally D orbitals? Yes, if there is a D orbital, right? They will always go in that same order from the lowest energy, the simplest orbitals, the smallest orbitals to the biggest orbitals. That's always going to go from low energy to high energy. So S, then P, then D. And where in the applicable, applicable, um, applicable an F orbital, except it's not a six F orbital. Just like that first d orbital showed up in n equals three. So going back to the colors here, n equals one, first energy level. n equals two is the second energy level. n equals one only has an s orbital. When you go up one energy level, you add a p orbital. Second energy level has two types of orbitals in it. The third Orbit, or third energy level has three types of orbitals, S, then P, then D. The fourth energy level is the first time we see an F orbital. So those F orbital 
So you still go in the same order. First the S orbital, then the P orbital, then the D orbital. Once that's all filled up, then you can get into the 4F orbital. It's in the sixth row of the periodic table. Because that F orbital is so high in energy that you don't start filling it up until after you fill up the 6S. But it still technically belongs to N equals 4. And to go back to the guitar strings analogy, changing energy levels is like changing guitar strings. You can have certain notes on a guitar string that are higher pitched than a, than a skinnier string right next to it, right? If you play high enough up on the fret, on the frets, you wind up with a higher energy note, even though you're on the lower energy string. Right? And that's basically what's happening here. That's why we have that mismatch. So the first row of the periodic table of the D block that belongs to 3D. That's N equals three, even though it's in the fourth row. The F block, the first F orbital that you see is actually 4F, even though it's in the sixth, or sixth row of the periodic table, right? So, and technically, mathematically, there are G orbitals, H orbitals, and so on. We never observed any of them because they're so high in energy that by the time we get enough electrons to start filling them up, we wind up with a nucleus that's so big it fragments and falls apart. So we've never observed G and H orbitals. F orbitals are the largest orbitals we've observed, so we don't need to worry about going past that. Um, but there's no, there's no, in theory, there's also a 5G orbital that you would fill up, I don't know, sometime, sometime after the seventh row of the periodic table, because we've gotten to the seventh row of the periodic table complete, and it's not, hasn't shown up yet, right? If it followed the same trend as before, maybe in the eighth row of the periodic table, after you filled up the what would that be the after you filled up the 6F, you might start filling up the 5G. Right? So then they start getting mismatched when you deal with the D and the F orbitals. Um, but there will always go in the same order, which is why we can always follow the periodic table. As long as you know those two things, your F block's wrong by two or two energy levels, and your D block is off by one energy level. All you need is the periodic table to, to fill out any of these, right? So, um, and they will always follow the same orbital other than some of the exceptions. And there are some, this P table actually has, so ptable.com, if you click on um, electrons up at the top and click expanded, it actually labels the exceptions. So all the ones that are in red don't follow our normal rules. For electron configuration they have something weird about them um, and you notice they tend to be when we start getting either near the end um, of a of an orbital or one less than halfway um, or sometimes at the very beginning of an orbital because sometimes we, it's easier to put that first electron into the 5d instead of the 4f so they got some weirdness that happens there and that's why i'm not going to ask you about any of the weirdness when it comes to this, if you're dealing with F orbitals or D orbitals, um, I'll either tell you it's, it's an exception and maybe ask you why you think it might be an exception, but more likely you'll just have to deal with them. They're either going to be empty or full for this class, All right? So just know that they're there, what's going on, um, but I'm not going to make you memorize the exceptions because I don't have all those exceptions memorized. So why should you? If you really like to memorize things, you could do that for fun, but that's very few people's idea of fun. And then last but not least, after lecture on Monday, I was wondering, are free radicals atoms that give off electrons? And how do antioxidants protect from them? Do they accept those electrons? That is literally exactly what's happening. A free radical means an unpaired electron. Some elements, but more problematically, um, some organic molecules can turn into free radicals if you shine the right wavelength of light on them. So you can have something, I'll use um, chlorine gas as an example. We'll talk about the wavelength compounds a bit today. 
If you take chlorine at, uh, as a molecule and you shine the right wavelength of light on it, you can actually get this bond to break and you turn it into two chlorine radicals that have these unpaired electrons, these unpaired electrons that were part of this bond holding it together. Problem is unpaired electrons are super unstable. And so when you do this, the next thing that happens is those three radicals steal an electron from something else. But if everything else in your body is made up of all of the even numbers of electrons, what happens when you steal one electron from an even number? I'm sorry, is this, like, is this the formula for chlorine gas? Yes, that's chlorine gas. Okay, that makes sense. So chlorine, if chlorine needs to regain one more electron to be stable so that you don't have an unpaired electron, it's going to do that by stealing an electron from something that has an even number of electrons. What happens to that thing you stole an electron from? When you take one away from an even number, you get an odd number, right? You go from having everything being paired up to now that organic molecule just lost an electron and now it's a free radical. And it goes around and it steals an electron from something else. And this it just creates this chain reaction where the only time it could ever end is if two of these happen to bump into each other and basically pair back up. And so this is why free radicals are so dangerous in your body is because eventually one of those molecules it's going to steal an electron from is going to be part of your DNA. And you can wind up with mutations happening in your genetic code as a result of having free radicals around. And so your body actually accounts for this by having what they call free radical scavenging pathways. And that's what antioxidants support. They basically are the vitamins that make up the pieces that your free radical scavenging pathways need. And so, and what they do is they basically go around and anytime they find an odd number of electrons, they either give up an electron to make it an even number, or they stick, take this electron and make it an even number. And so that's all antioxidants do is basically go around and try and prevent any of these free radicals from, from causing problems, trying to catch them before they do too much damage to your cells. Um, so free radicals are a good thing to avoid, but nobody can really avoid them because the number one source of free radicals in, I think I can say anything on earth, just about any living organism on earth um, is oxygen gas. When you breathe oxygen, your body breaks down oxygen to use it to break down sugar and make ATP. Um, that oxygen gets turned into a peroxide, which has a possibility of breaking apart into free radicals. So basically, if you breathe, you will eventually get cancer. <laughs> Sounds a little fatalistic. Um, but just goes to show you can't eliminate free radicals from your diet entirely. You can't eliminate carcinogens entirely because oxygen is a carcinogen. What are you going to do? Um, so it's all about balancing risk, right? Um, is smoking one cigarette going to give you cancer? Probably not. It's probably not even going to significantly change your odds of getting cancer compared to the oxygen you're breathing. Um, is a whole bunch of cigarettes every day? Probably. Um, because you're significantly altering your odds at that point. All right. So valence electrons. We ended talking about valence electrons, and we're going to tie this back into what we were just talking about. So um, when we're talking about valence electrons, what was our definition? And the highest energy level. I'm going to take issue with saying orbital because it's the entire energy level, right? And so if I go back here to this um, chart, if you have any electrons in N equals three, if N equals three is our highest occupied energy level, whatever electrons you have in N equals three, those are your valence electrons. And you're just going to you just count them up. So it's actually easier to look at it in terms of your electron configuration than to look at the, this view of the periodic table in general, because if we um, if we look at the electron configuration for uh, let's say 
let's say chlorine. Chlorine as an atom is gonna have an electron configuration that looks like, or the orbital diagram is gonna look like this. You've got a full N equals one. You've got a full second energy level. Then you've got in the third energy level, you have a full S orbital and then an almost full P orbital, right? It's not just the electrons in the P orbital, it's everything in N equals three. So it'd be a total of seven valence electrons, not five. At the temptation, when you're, if you're doing this by writing electron configurations, the temptation is to say, okay, well, whatever the last thing I write is my valence. So you can just say five, but that'd be wrong because it's everything with the three in front of it is part of the valence. All right, so, and that means everything, every, unless it's, there's an exception, um, everything in the D block, all of these have 4s2 and then 3d5, right? 3d6, 3d7, 3d8. Those 3d, that's not the valence. The valence level is n equals four. So for all of those, unless it's an exception, you're gonna have two valence electrons. Chromium is an exception, it only has one valence electron. Copper is an exception, it only has one valence electron. Again, I wouldn't, if I gave you this electron configuration and asked you how many valence electrons it has, um, you should be able to do that, but I'm not gonna make you measure the, or memorize the exceptions. All right, so why does the valence, why does that matter? It, close, that's protons, right? But it determines what the element will do because what types of orbitals are the most stable? What do you wanna to do to make things more stable? Fill or empty. You don't want partially filled orbitals, right? So if you know what the electron configuration is, if you know what the val how many valence electrons you have, you can predict what ions are gonna be stable. If I go back here a second and look, click on oxidation states, oxidation states is another way of saying charge. So basically it's all of these numbers down here telling you what are the stable charge charges you can have. Right, and so you can predict that just by looking at how many electrons you have in the valence. So beryllium has two valence electrons. In fact, everything in column two has two valence electrons, right? Because that corresponds to whatever the energy level is, S orbital with two electrons in it, right? So all of these are gonna become most stable, all of them except for helium, when you lose those two electrons, because then we basically kick out those two valence electrons and now we only have full energy levels. We don't have any partially filled energy levels anymore, right? So, and I, most of you either read the slides or watched Khan Academy videos. I kind of, I knew that they're that asking you what the most stable charges on the quiz was a bit of a stretch, but it's good for a college class. Sometimes you have to learn things, put things together on your own before we, not necessarily because we run out of time, although that happens too, but also it's about teaching you to answer your own questions, right? Well, why, what is the most stable charge going to be? And trying to figure that out, right? And so it was oxygen and Um, oxygen and sodium, I believe, right? So oxygen, when we look at its electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, right? To fill that second energy level, it needs to gain two electrons. If it's gonna gain two electrons, it's gonna have what charge? Mm -hmm. Negative two, don't forget the electrons are negative. So two extra electrons is a negative two charge. Again, blame Ben Franklin. Sodium has one extra electron 
it has one electron in the 3s orbital, one electron in n equals three. So to become more stable, it just gets rid of an electron. Right, so that means its most stable charge is going to be when it's plus one. Right, and so some, some people asked about, well, why do we care how many valence electrons something has? Well, because it tells us one, how stable it is as a neutral atom, but also it tells us what the atom is going to be. Um, so valence actually, it's, it's a term that most specifically gets used in chemistry, but it actually has a psychology term. It actually comes from a psychology term. And the valence in psychology mean, basically means an individual's potential or ability to change. Because that's really what we're talking about with these elements too. How many electrons it has tells you, is it likely to change and how? Which allows us to predict a lot of, of um, properties. So we can practice with a bunch of these. Let's look specifically at zinc and zinc ion. So if I go back to the periodic table here, how many valence electrons does zinc have? Just the two, right? It's got a full 3D orbital, but that's in the third energy level. So it only has two electrons in the fourth energy level. So to answer this, if we're counting valence electrons, zinc has two valence electrons. Here it is. What about zinc when it's a plus two? What's the electron configuration look like for zinc when it's plus two? So zinc two plus is gonna look like one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P6, three D, 10, and we lost those two 4s electrons, right? So it has zero electrons in the fourth energy level, which means the fourth energy level is not the valence level anymore, right? Because valence by definition means the highest occupied energy level. So what's the highest occupied energy level now? Now it's n equals three. So now how many valence electrons does it have? Eighteen valence electrons. When you lose electrons, you can shift what level is your valence, right? And so this results in what's what we call the. Um, so if we're talking about nonmetals, nonmetals get more stable by gaining electrons by filling up the energy level that they already have electrons in, and the nonmetals are let's see everything to the right of that line i just drew everything to the right of that stair step is a non-metal all of those elements get more stable by gaining electrons and so for all of those they're all going to become most stable when they get to how many valence electrons? Eight, right? Because for each of these, we're not counting the D block when it comes to valence electrons, right? Or the F block. So the only, L, the only orbitals that matter when it comes to your valences for nonmetals are the S and the P. And so all of these are trying to get to eight valence electrons. All of these already have eight valence electrons. So what that, that leads us to a rule that's called the octet rule, which 
the way. In the octet rule, there, um, just says that you're going to be most stable when you have eight valence electrons. That doesn't work. You see this term, it gets used in chemistry classrooms, but it gets used a lot more in biology classrooms because biologists only care about nonmetals for the most part because all biological molecules are predominantly carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, all nonmetals. So for, for the sake of biology and biochemistry, this is a really good rule. Forget about the D block because it's weird anyway, right? But it means that that octet rule isn't really a rule. It's only a rule for the nonmetals because for things like these, these um, transition metals, they can actually have 18 valence electrons to become more stable. All right, so when we're going, how, so we're going to talk a little bit about what are referred to as periodic properties or periodic trends. Periodic just means repeating, right? Like a sine wave is periodic. So a periodic trend means it's relating to the periodic table. We can use the periodic table to predict some of these things. Valence electrons, well, we can do electron configuration from the periodic table, right? Which means we can definitely figure out valence electrons from the periodic table. And in a group, now group means column on the periodic table. Um, in the old school way of, um, of labeling these, there was, they used Roman numerals on the periodic table. Um, so you would have like, you know, call, it would be like column one A, one B, then it was one or one A, then two A, then it was one B, two B. There was all these weirdness with, with uh, letters and Roman numerals mixed together. Kind of gotten rid of that. Finally, the chemists have gotten all on the same page and we just label them one to, column one to 18. And then that gets rid of some of that confusion, right? So when we say group, we mean column. Um, but I don't want you to be totally weirded out if you see, you know, group 1A. I don't even remember which one group 1, well, I group 1A, I, knew, I do. But if you ask me which one is group 3B, I don't, I would have to go look it up myself. So for the most part, we're just going to stick to columns. If you see that notation and you don't know what it means, go look it up. Right, you don't need to memorize it, but you just need to know that it's there and it's referring to a column and you can go figure out what that column is. Um, atomic radius is another one that we can look at. And so those of you who did the, um, the homework last week probably ran into this, right? Because we didn't quite finish these slides last, last week. Um, atomic radius we can predict from the periodic table because as we get to higher energy levels, higher energy levels are higher in energy because they're further away from the nucleus. Think about, think about um, a bowling ball being lifted off the surface of the earth. The further it goes into the air, the farther it has to fall, right? The farther it is from its most stable state. So higher energy level would mean physically that those electrons have more distance to fall. They can get closer to the nucleus. So we're always gonna start with the smallest elements, the smallest orbitals or the lowest energy orbitals and the biggest orbitals are the ones that where you're starting to get into those higher energy levels, right? So your atomic radius increases when you increase the number of energy levels. And when do you increase the number of energy levels if you're looking at the periodic table? When do you add an energy level? Every row. Every row is another energy level, right? So every time you go down a row, the radius gets bigger. 
And I think so. And this actually allows us to to look at the shape of these um, as well and color code them. So the smallest ones are the ones that are green. Did not get, really give me, I want that color. There we go. And the largest ones are the ones that are darkest red. So what do you notice about these trends? Where are the biggest atoms going to be? More left and lower, right? Further, more rows means more energy levels. When you go from left to right, though, within the same energy level, you actually get smaller, which seems counterintuitive because you're making its ways more, right? When you go from left to right, you have more electrons. How is it getting smaller? More protons. And what do protons do to electrons? They pull them in, right? Electrons are attracted to protons. So if you have more protons, you're gonna pull those electrons in tighter. So in the same energy level, you get smaller when you go from left to right. And then all of a sudden you fill up an energy level and it jumps back the other direction. And you add a whole new energy level and it gets bigger again. So it's kind of like a typewriter where it goes, it goes down, keeps going, keeps going, and then ding, resets and gets bigger again, and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you fill an energy level. And then ding resets again. Um, and I think, where's that chart? Look it up real quick. Atomic radius versus atomic number. That one. When you go from left to right, and you can actually clearly see every time you fill up an energy level and start a new one. All of those weird spikes are when you filled up an energy level, and that spike is where you add your first electron into your new energy level. So column one is the peak of each of those, right? Lithium and sodium and potassium and rubidium and cesium and francium. That's column one on the periodic table. The last one before you hit that spike in each of these are your, is column 18. They call the noble, they're called the noble gases because they don't react. Um, and that comes, I'm not sure if it was a, a play on you know, British stoicism, stiff upper lip, don't, don't let them see that they're bothering you sort of. No, that's what noble gases do, they don't react. Um, or I kind of think of it more like they don't do anything. Noble gases don't do anything. So they're noble because nobles didn't really do anything either other than happen to be born into being landowners. So what that means is when we're comparing things in terms of atomic radius, it's always gonna be either in terms of ranking them one, two, three from largest to smallest or comparing two of them, which of them is bigger. I don't. Again, I'm not gonna make you memorize atomic radii. That's dumb, you can always look that up, right? Everybody's carrying around a cell phone with more computing power than the Apollo missions had. So we don't need to memorize these things anymore. It just means that you're looking at primarily how many energy levels you have. And if they have the same energy levels, then you look at which one has more protons because more protons means you're pulling things in tighter, therefore smaller. Right, so neon versus carbon. So carbon and neon, both in second energy level, right? Neon has extra protons relative to carbon. So that means neon is gonna be smaller than carbon 
And so one of the ways you can think about adding electrons, but it doesn't change the size, it doesn't make it bigger, even though you're adding something, it's kind of like putting more roommates into the same apartment. How, how big is your apartment? It doesn't change based on how many people live there, right? Your apartment is the same size regardless. That's like having one energy level is one apartment. You get to a point where your apartment's full and instead of adding a ninth roommate into your four bedroom apartment, it becomes better option to get a new apartment, right? That's your new energy level. All of a sudden your size increases dramatically. So aluminum versus gallium. So same column, different energy level. So which one's bigger? Gallium. That's the easy one. That's the intuitive one, right? The fact that it gets smaller when you go left to right is the tricky part, right? And you just have to remember it's all about the protons changing. Um, magnesium or bromine? That's a tricky one because you have two variables changing, right? I won't, on a test, I won't ask you this question. I'll try to limit it to only one variable is changing at a time. Magnesium has one fewer energy level, but it also has a lot fewer protons pulling electrons in, right? So this is one where we would actually want to look it up. You can't just use the periodic trends in this case because they're telling you two different things. Further to the right should be smaller, but in more energy levels should be bigger. So in this case, we go and look it up. And here, so bromine is right there and magnesium's there. So magnesium is actually bigger than bromine, despite the fact bromine has more energy levels. And that's just due to that difference. And again, this is the sort of thing that um, I don't, I will not ask a test question where you have two variables, two trends opposing each other. If two things are changing at the same time, they should both be working together. For instance, if I asked instead, Take it back, go back to my periodic table. If I asked you about chlorine versus strontium, chlorine's further to the right, strontium is over here. Further to the right should mean smaller and chlorine also has fewer energy levels. Right, so both of the variables are working. They both say that chlorine should be smaller, right? So if two things are happening at the same time, I'm going to try to structure the questions that way. But be aware that that's, that's the way to approach this is look at it and say, okay, what's changing between this pair? And then say, try to interpret it. If two things are changing, be aware of that, right? Pay attention to it. All right, one more of these, then we'll take a quick break. And by these, I mean concept, ionization energy. And ionization energy, before you get too hung up on trying to read this, you need to know what ionization energy is. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron. So if it has low ionization energy, it's easy to take an electron away. If it has high ionization energy, it's really hard to take an electron away. Well, knowing what we know about, about um, electron configurations, that means that the periodic table tells us this too, right? Because what's gonna be really hard to take an electron away from? anything that's already stable, right? If you've already got the full electron configuration or full orbital, it's hard to take an electron away from it. Or even the closer you get to being a full orbital, the harder it is to take an electron away. Fluorine is really, really hard to take an electron away from. 
versus column one, what do we know about column one when it comes to electron configurations? Well, in terms of what is the what does the valence look like for column one? Just one electron, right? See the three s one or two s one, which means in order to get to having only filled energy levels, all you have to do is lose a single electron and you get more stable. So everything on this side should be really, really easy to take an electron away from. Everything on that side should be really hard to take an electron away from. And the more energy levels you have, the easier it is to get an electron away because it's not as close to the nucleus. It's already at a higher energy level. So it doesn't take that much extra energy to pull that electron right off, right? So ionization energy increases as you, sorry, decreases as you go from top to bottom and increases when you go from left to right within the same energy level. And again, if it happened to be one of those where you had those two variables fighting against each other, you would want to look it up. But in general, all metals are going to have a lower ionization energy than any of the non-metals. So if you're comparing metal to non-metal, that's all you really need to know. A non-metal will always have a higher ionization energy than a metal. If I used an absolute there, I'm not sure I like it. I'm sure there are exceptions. But the general trend is non-metal is going to be a higher ionization energy. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at quarter after and we'll talk, we'll do some math. Not very. Um, I'm trying to think. The only reason I had hesitated is because I left the I left my folder full of labs to grade at home. Oh. Um, but I think that one is still here because I'm not to that point yet. So I, it's in my office. Okay. Um, Can I get my chance? Yeah. You want to um, come by at lab or do you have lab today? No. But, but uh, if you can, yeah, if you can just okay. come by after. Cool. I just want to read. Yeah. Do that. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. 
Right, while we're waiting for everybody else to uh, come back in here, if you wanted a third definition for valence, just to further muddy the waters, um, you also have my daughter valence. Uh, as you can see, she's very high energy. Uh, my wife actually came up with that. We were looking for different unique names. We like unique names. And so we, she came up with valence. So valence is also my daughter. And this was, this was yesterday, as you can tell, she's a little manic sometimes um, when she starts making French toast on Mother's Day. She really got into it, as you can tell. Um, but, uh, and then there's probably her more common state is um, her don't fuck with me face. Um, so she, didn't, she was only three at this point. She didn't want to be going to daycare that day. So just because now it's finally come to the point where the word valence means my daughter to me more than it means chemistry. Um, I, it's harder to give this lecture without talking about my valence. Um, all right, so when we're talking, somebody else asked the question about valence electrons and how did they know when, el when valence electrons were discovered, how did this really occur? And it really comes down to um, the fact that, that Mendeleev noticed how the periodic table was structured before they even knew about electrons. I mean, they knew what an electron was, but they didn't know that electrons governed all of this. So the, the idea of a valence electron in the way that the reason that we consider the different rows to be different energy levels, it really comes down to um, you know, why, why is 3D filled up after 4S? Why does it really belong in N equals three? It comes down to the math that Niels Bohr and Einstein and Max Planck all discovered in the early 1900s of governing quantum mechanics. The, the math says, well, it's the first D orbital. And when N equals three in this equation, when the quantum number equals three, you can have this extra orbital type that they then defined as a D orbital, right? And so it, it wasn't until they defined those, those four quantum numbers, which would be energy level, orbital type, um, orbital orientation, so which of the three boxes that are you putting an electron in and spin? It wasn't until you had those four numbers. Those are the four numbers that make a valid solution to the quantum mechanics equations, right? So the same way that you could only have the harmonics on a guitar string in certain places, there were only certain solutions to these equations, the Schrodinger's equations. And that means that you have to plug in the right quantum numbers to get there. And that's what led to the idea of energy levels and the, the uh, and valence electrons really being mirrored on the periodic table is because those are the mathematical answers that actually give you a solution that makes sense. Otherwise you get imaginary numbers as your results if you try to solve it with non-integer numbers or non-quantum numbers in these spots. So it really came down to, to that. It's like, well, the valence electrons is a convenient way to describe that highest occupied energy level. And it wasn't really discovered so much as they put two and two together. They had this weird math over here. They had this weird shape of the periodic table over there. Somebody, probably Niels Bohr, one of, one of his contemporaries figured out that those two things overlapped. And, it, and valence electrons was where they overlapped is the term we use to describe that. All right, this last one, I want you to be aware of it. I'm not usually gonna ask about metallic character because it's a little bit more qualitative and harder to define at this point. Um, metallic character actually has a number for, relate, for rating how metallic a substance is. It's a combination of electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, how malleable something is. Malleable means we talked, oh, we did, we talked about gold, right? Malleable means able to be hammered into a thin sheet without breaking. Metals tend to have all of those characteristics, low uh, or high conductivity for electrons, low um, specific heat, and very malleable and also ductile, which is 
um, when you, if you take two ends of a piece of metal and you pull it, you can actually stretch it into being a wire. That's what ductile means. Um, and metals have all those properties, but we don't have ability to actually put a number to any of those because this isn't a materials science class or, or a mechanical engineering class. Um, so just qualitatively, things that are, that have a low ionization energy also tend to be more metallic. So down into the left is gonna be your most metallic elements and up into the right are your least metallic elements, which doesn't really match with what we see in everyday life though, right? Because what are the things we think of as being metallic? What elements? Iron, gold, copper, silver, aluminum. Those are all over here, right? Those are not metallic compared to some of these other metals. We just consider them metallic because they're stable enough in oxygen that we actually see them in their metal state. Most of these other ones that are more metallic are so reactive that you couldn't actually use them in any application where you care about um, metallic character, right? It doesn't really matter if potassium makes a really, really fantastic wiring material if it bursts into flames the second it gets exposed to moisture, right? So practically speaking, we don't use these the way we think in everyday life of metals being used, but they are, they do have a higher metallic character because they're more malleable, more ductile, more conductive, et cetera. In fact, potassium and sodium are so malleable that you can actually cut them with a butter knife. Um, but again, it would be really handy as an electrician to not have to use like wire cutters to be able to like roll it out like Play-Doh, right? And make circuits, that would be really cool. Um, unfortunately, that's not very practical. If you take, here's another plug for Gen Chem for a fun lab. Um, even more fun than the flame test we did last week are when we get to take, instead of just burning potassium and methanol, we take a chunk of potassium metal and throw it in water and it explodes like a firework. Um, almost the second it hits the water. It hits the water, it's less dense than water, so it acts as a metal that floats. Um, and then it catches fire, like purple flames right away and then explodes. Um, because it's so reactive. And we'll, act, we'll do that level. I, you guys don't get to play with the potassium um, because the liability insurance would be through the roof. Um, but I will do that for you. And if you're wondering what all those stains and burn marks are on the inside of the fumoids, that's what that is. It's the remnants of, of blowing up potassium in water a few times. All right, so just be aware of what metallic character is. I'm not really gonna ask questions about it. It's worth talking about because it is related. Um, all right, as, plan, as promised, now we get to do some math. You guys never thought you'd be excited to be going back to math, but now we're not talking about quantum mechanics anymore, right? So it's a little easier to wrap your head around maybe. Um, we're actually going to define some of those mass units, those mass numbers on the periodic table and use them in a, in a usable way. One of the reasons we care so much about the atomic mass numbers on the periodic table is because it allows us to get between something we can measure to something that we can't, which would be something like how many atoms do you have? So if we have reactions happening, so let's say we have a chemical reaction happening where we had hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas, and it reacts to make water molecules. Well, this reaction that Dalton's atomic theories or theory um, says these have to be combined in whole number ratio. These atoms, we can't directly measure the atoms themselves, but we can only use whole number of atoms. We can't have a part of an atom, right? So when we're talking about how much of these different compounds can react or how much product we can make. We can't just do it in terms of atoms because we can't measure atoms. But we also can't just do it in terms of grams because a gram is not the same as saying one gram is not the same as saying one hydrogen atom, right? That is different mass numbers and a different number of nucleons, neutrons and protons 
tell us that we have to have whole number ratios of these. And so we have a conversion that we're going to use that allows us to convert between mass and atoms or mass and molecules. And it's gonna be different for every compound. It's gonna be different for every element. It's gonna be different for every isotope. If you have one specific isotope, it's gonna be different. This is one of those reasons you have to have a periodic table because you can't memorize all this. So the, the basic definition of an atomic mass unit, which again is just gonna be the, the unit we use to talk about how heavy a certain, a single atom is, is one atomic mass unit is defined as 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Anya? Um, That's a typo. This one on the bottom, I was typing that as we went when I was doing this on Zoom. So that should be an 05. And really, I'm just going to delete this because we'll do it. We'll write it out by hand here in a second. So this allows us to give a put a mass to a single molecule. So for instance, a Proteins are really, really big in terms of, of um, in terms of atoms. So if we say one protein weighs 4.72 times 10 to the fifth atomic mass units, so that'd be 472,000 atomic mass units. How many grams is that? How could we get there? Well, we can go AMU to kilograms, right? That's our new conversion we just added, and then we can go kilograms to grams, right? So just, I just got the pen to work. What are you doing? 4.72 times 10 to the five AMU. One AMU has this absurdly small mass. And then one kilogram is a lot of grams, right? A kilogram is bigger than a gram. What do we get for number in grams? be something really small, right? So we have 472,000 times 10 to the minus 27. So we should get something times 10 to the minus 22 in kilograms and then another thousand, so 10 to the minus 19 maybe? Five, six times 10 to the 19. Give me one more sig fig. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. And that's times 10 to the minus 19. So in other words, 0 0.18 zeros, then 784 grams. Can we measure that directly? Now we have pretty good scales. Those, those balances in the chem lab, they're pretty standard for, for the labs. Um, going to the thousands place as accurately as they do means they cost about 500 to $1,000 a piece. Um, and they still only go to three decimal places to the milligrams, right? It's just not possible air current, you couldn't get rid of enough air currents to be able to measure this mass directly. So what we do instead is we deal with groups of atoms. So it's just like almost never buy a single egg because who needs a single egg? Who's ever needed one single egg for something? You never need one single egg, right? Okay, maybe one of you has. I always have somebody who says that. Um, 
So we grew, do in groups of atoms. And so instead of a dozen eggs, we deal with moles of atoms. Cute little mole, but not like that. A mole is a counting unit. So it's for keeping track of how many of something you have. So if you have a dozen eggs is 12 eggs, right? A dozen atoms, you have a dozen of anything, right? A dozen just means 12 of something. A mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that object. So you could have a mole of atoms, you can have a mole of eggs. You could have a mole of ping pong balls. Fun fact, a mole of ping pong balls would be enough ping pong balls to cover the entire surface of the earth in a layer about a mile deep. Just to give you an idea of how big this number is. A trillion is 10 to the 12th. So 10 to the 23rd is like a trillion trillion. Right, if you have the, there's a, a fun, um, Web comic called XKCD, and the author has a physics PhD and likes to answer weird questions. Somebody asked him, um, "What would happen if you had a mole of moles?" Um, and the answer, so let's see, is some good diagrams. Um, if you grabbed a mole of moles, um, it would actually cover the Earth so that Mount Everest barely registered. You'd cover the entire surface of the earth um, in a layer 80 kilometers deep, which would ru be roughly the same mass as our moon. So if you had a mole of moles, it gets really kind of gruesome for the moles um, because you wind up with them being so much gravity at the inside of that, of that new molar, molar moon that they wind up getting liquefied and turning into like fossil fuel type material. Um, and then on the outside, they all freeze to death. Um, so poor moles, don't gather a mole of moles. Don't be a bad idea. Um, that just allows us to count in terms of a, a relevant number of atoms. This is a pretty common number of atoms. In fact, this number comes from, it's defined as being the number of atoms in 12, in exactly 12 grams of carbon 12. Carbon 12 is one of, is probably the most relevant element and isotope to humans since we're mostly carbon based. So they just said, okay, we're gonna say carbon 12 is our, is our official definition. 12 grams of carbon 12 has exactly one mole of atoms in it. So, and 12 grams is really not that much when we're talking about carbon. Think about I don't, so anything carbon-based. You could think about um, know, hot chocolate mix. What's 12 grams of hot chocolate mix look like? It's less than a packet of hot chocolate mix, right? So it's a ton of atoms. Atoms are really, really tiny is the bullet point here. And we deal with huge groups of atoms at a time. And it's just one more conversion as well. If we have... Um, moles of hydrogen, and we want to turn that into atoms of hydrogen, we just do that with a quick conversion. We can say, okay, well, 1.45 moles and one mole has a specific definition. One mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Objects, but in this case, we're talking about atoms. So we just Really, we only use moles for atoms or molecules because anything else is too big. So you can have a mole of anything, but you pretty much never will. So it's just, that's easy enough, right? And all of a sudden this gives us the ability to actually take that really small mass that we calculated and actually put it into a mass that we can measure. So you might not be able to measure the mass of a single protein, but if you can measure the mass of a mole of proteins, that's something you can measure in the lab. So here's, here's a key definition here. 
one, exactly 12 grams of carbon, 12 has 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So, and if the mass of one carbon atom is 12.000 AMU, we get this equality down here. One AMU per atom is exactly the same as one gram per mole. And so that's the, this is the form we're actually going to use it in because we almost, like I said, we almost never care about the mass of a single atom or the, how many atoms we have. We're gonna measure things in terms of moles of atoms or grams of substance. And so if we wanted to actually show the work here, we could say one mole of carbon 12 is exactly 12.00 AMU or 12.00 grams, wind up basically with 12.000 divided by 12.000 and you get grams per mole. So let's do some practice with this. If we have 0.5 moles of gold, how much would that weigh? We need two pieces of information to do that. If we wanna know how many atoms of gold we have, we could use that 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is also known as Avogadro's number. Um, if we did this on, on Cinco de Mayo, it lends itself to the guacamole joke. You need avocado, avocado's number to make proper guacamole like a chemist. It's Avogadro's number, not avocado's number. Um, and that's this number right there, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And it gets written on your equation sheet. It's written as capital N sub A is Avogadro's number, 6.022. 10 to the 23rd objects. So if we want to know the moles of gold or how much, what the mass of 0.5 moles of gold is, we need to know how much gold weighs, right? And that's where your mass on the periodic table comes in. Because if you look at gold, Gold has an atomic mass of 1.96.97, or sorry, 196.97. No units written. That's those masses are in AMU, which means they're also in grams per mole. So we can say, okay, well, if I have 0 0.5 moles of AU and one, if we had a, an entire mole of gold atoms, it would be 100, hundred and ninety six point nine seven grams. Just set it up so moles cancels moles, right? We're left in grams. So what is that? 98.48? Four, yeah, four nine. Ish. Okay. My mental arithmetic slow these days, but I can still cut something in half easily if it's an even number anyway. So knowing if you have, we're never gonna know we have 0.5 moles of gold, but if we need to weigh out 0.5 moles of something, we just, it depends on what it is. And we use that molecular or that atomic mass number, right? So if we wanted to, Let's say we wanted to do this reaction and to get this reaction to happen properly, you need the right ratio of hydrogen 
atoms to oxygen atoms. You get a two to one ratio for this reaction to happen properly. If we want to make two moles of hydrogen gas, we can say, okay, well, 2.0 moles. And then we look at the periodic table. The periodic table says, okay, hydrogen is 1.0079 is mass of hydrogen. That's for a single hydrogen atom. We actually have H2, so we need two of those, right? We can say, okay, for one mole of H2, it'd be 1.0079 times two, because there's two of them here. Grams of hydrogen. All right, so that in that all of a sudden now we're in units of grams, right? And now we say, okay, I'm going to generate hydrogen until I make four grams of hydrogen. This allows us to get these to mix in the right ratios. If we don't have the right ratio of atoms, then our reaction doesn't happen properly. It also works the other way. If we measure a mass and we want to turn that into moles, we just go the other direction. So let's look at silver. Let's say we, we went through a reaction and we generated 0.795 grams of silver, which is not very much silver, not enough to collect it and sell it on the black market or anything like that. If we wanted to know how many moles that was, we want to cancel out grams and be left in moles, right? So we need to set it up. So we have grams of silver on the bottom and moles of silver on top. So I don't have the mass of silver memorized. So we go back to the periodic table one once again. 107.87 grams per mole. For naturally occurring silver on earth, that's the atomic mass. It's a mixture of different isotopes that on average has this many grams for every mole of silver atoms. So we wind up with a really small number, right? Like 0 0.0007, 0 6? Seven six ish seven four. seven four. Our same rules apply for sig figs. We have three sig figs there. Our atomic mass is a measured number, which means that counts for sig figs. So just always make sure you have at least as many sig figs in your atomic mass as whatever you started with. If you don't, just get a better periodic table because usually you can find a periodic table with more sig figs on it if you look. So 737. All right, so. Again, it might not be entirely clear yet. I know I keep telling you, well, sometimes we need to have this many atoms or this many moles of atoms. We'll get specific examples and we'll do a lab next week where we actually measure out the weight of a substance, force it to go through a chemical reaction, measure the weight at the end, and we can see how much the mass changed and tie that down to specific number of moles of atoms that we had that reacted. Um, so it basically, this is one of the main tools for, um, for chemists and biochemists when it comes to figuring out how much of a reaction can happen. How much medication do you need? Well, the reason that different medications, even if they have similar methods, like different, I don't know, different opiates, for example, have different um, dosages, partly because 
they're, they're more potent or less potent, but also because they have different molecular weights. And so to get to the same number of molecules per liter of blood, you need to get a different number of grams, right? So because all of these chemical reactions happen in terms of atoms, not in terms of grams. All right, one more concept and we'll keep practicing with this. So I keep saying that the, the atomic masses are based on the naturally occurring number of or isotopes. So everything, every sample of matter you get is going to be an isotope. It might be, a, depending on what the element is, that'll tell you how many protons it has, but even the most common isotopes are still isotopes, right? So it's not like, there's the normal version and then the isotopes are the weird version. The normal version is still an isotope. So, and the reason I say that is because, just because of the way that this, it gets, I see this wording a lot. Do these elements not have isotopes? No, this, every element has to have an isotope. It might only have one isotope, but every element will have at at least one isotope, right? And so the periodic table that has these numbers that aren't that close to a whole number, like for instance, chlorines, 35.45 is the mass number for chlorine. Well, that's not that close to a whole number, right? That tells us that there must be a significant number of two, at least two isotopes mixed together. And when you measure that atomic mass in grams per mole, it says, okay, if you get 6.0 times 10 to the 23rd chlorine atoms, it's going to weigh this much. Some of them weigh more than 35 AMU. Some of them weigh less than 35 AMU. But your average is going to be 35.45, right? And so it's the, the way we calculate that is by using what's called natural abundance. Um, which is also known as, um, it's also known as mole fraction. They use the same variable for both of these, mole fraction and, and natural abundance are basically what is the decimal amount of, of this mixture. So um, think of like a percentage divided by a hundred, it's a decimal, right? Mole fraction is just that decimal. Um, and it gets represented with that Greek letter. It's a Greek letter, but it looks like a fancy X. Um, that's a Greek letter chi, C-H-I. And it's always the moles. Sorry, I looked in the wrong spot. I confused myself. Um, the, the variable we use for moles is N. Um, and the abbreviation for moles as a unit, I'm going to be picky about this because you can't just write lowercase m. Lowercase m is meters, right? You can't write mo either. So they shorten it up by a whole letter. It's just mol is your shorthand for moles. You have to write mol. You can't just write lowercase m. You can't even write capital M because that means moles per liter. So it has to be MOL. So mole fraction is how many moles you have of component A divided by moles total. So mole fraction of A is moles of A divided by total moles. This, this is useful because this ratio is basically your, your likelihood, your probability of picking a certain, um, a certain isotope. So think of, you can think of all the different isotopes like being, I don't know, colored ping pong balls in a, in a um, claw, claw game at, in an arcade. If you pick up a green ping pong ball, it has this mass. If you pick up a pink ping pong ball, it has that mass. Your mole fraction is what is the percentage of each in that total mixture, right? If it's 75% green ping pong balls, 
you've got a 75% chance that the ping pong ball you grab is green, right? And so it's basically, that's all it is. It's just your, your percentage, except not multiplied by 100. So what this means for this equation, so remember, what does that sigma mean? Sum. So your total atomic mass is equal to your natural abundance or your mole fraction of each isotope times the mass of that isotope. Right, so if you have, let's, we'll do chlorine since I know it close to the right answer off the top of my head. Um, Chlorine is a mixture of chlorine 37 that has a mass of, just call it 37 exactly, and a percent abundance of chlorine 37 is about a quarter. So out of all the chlorine atoms on earth, about a quarter of them are chlorine 37. The other 75% are chlorine 35. That has a mass, we'll just call it exactly 35 grams per mole. It's really a little bit different because of that binding energy. And our mole fraction here has to be 75 because the two mole fractions have to add up to 100%, right? They have to add up to one. If we only have two isotopes, they have their mole fractions have to add up to one. So if we want to know what the atomic mass of chlorine is, we say, okay, the atomic mass of chlorine is equal to 0 0.25 times 37 grams per mole plus 0 0.75 times 35 grams per mole. If we have numbers with more sig figs, we'll get closer to the right answer. But when we, if you just plug this in, you'll get a number that's 35.5, right? So this is what's happening anytime you have an atomic mass that's not close to a whole number. It means you have more than one isotope present and that atomic mass on the periodic table is the result of this weighted average this probability times how much each of those probabilities weighs, right? So it's the same math that you do for, prep, for figuring out your grade in a class that has weighted categories or figuring out what your um, expected outcome is playing a, a gambling game. If you have a 75% chance of winning and when you win, you get this much money and you have a 25% chance of losing and when you lose, you lose this much money you can add those up to get your, your likely outcome, right? It's basically what this is doing. The probability of each times the weight of each, right? And if you know this, you can solve for one of these as well. That's going to be the tricky one that we'll practice with. All right. Thanks for sticking with me a minute over. I'll see half of you for lab in a little bit. Um, Wednesday lab, it's a paper lab. So if you wanted to take a look at it, you could probably get out of class a lot earlier on Wednesday. Um, if you come having already attempted the lab, we're not actually doing any wet chemistry this week. It's all going to be just a paper lab. Have a good one. Yeah.